Good morning, church. It's good to be here and good to share God's word with you this morning. I also want to say a special good morning to all our kids who would usually be in kids' church but are here this morning. You've picked a good morning to be here, especially if you've come to Glow Kids or Youth Group, because as we were thinking through what to preach on in the lead up to Christmas, we landed on the same topic that we've just gone through in both Glow Kids and Youth Group. So you're going to know the answers. Adults, if you have any questions after the sermon, go see someone from this height to this height, under the age of 18, they will know the answers. Before we get into the sermon this morning, I just want to begin with a little bit of a story, a little bit of a confession, really. And it's something that Zali and I identified very early on in marriage. Something that we identified and we went, okay, we're going to have to keep an eye on this. We're going to have to navigate this together and make sure it doesn't turn into a problem. And the thing that I'm talking about is the reality, the truth, that I eat a lot more food than she does. (laughs) I consume food like there is no tomorrow. I've grown up in a household of three boys. I don't know how much we cost mum and dad in food. It would have been a lot. And Zali, she comes from a family of three girls, eats nowhere near the same amount. She tries some days and does a good job, but the reality is I consume food significantly better and significantly more than Zali does. And that's generally okay when it comes to breakfast and lunch and dinner, because we usually make enough and that's all good. But where it gets a little bit spicy is when it comes to snacks especially chocolate chips and and all that kind of good stuff, because I have what I've self-diagnosed myself with, and I call it open packet syndrome, okay? (laughs) Once I open a block of chocolate, doesn't matter whether it's a big one, the small one, a big bag of chips, small bag of chips, once I open it, that packet has to be eaten. If I put it to the side, I start to feel sorry for it, (laughs) because it's going to go bad. If I sit there with half a block of chocolate, I go, it's crying out, I need to eat it, I need to put it out of its misery. (laughs) Zali, on the other hand, she has what I call (laughs) self-restraint. And so she's the type of person who can buy a block of chocolate, can break off one row, which I think only has four pieces in it, doesn't even fill the mouth. Four, Four pieces, she'll eat that, she'll close it up, put it in the cupboard or the fridge, and will have no feeling or sense of urgency to go and finish it. (laughs) And if I see it in the fridge, I've got this cry of outrage from it saying, please eat me, eat me. I consume a lot of food. That's just the reality of it. And I promise I tell that story because it comes in to be relevant later. But if you're keeping up with your calendar, you'll know that today is the third day of December. We're into the final month of the year. Where has it gone? Crazy, right? And if it's the third day of December, that means there's only 22 days till Christmas. I hope you're getting ready. It's exciting, though. I love this time of year. I love it because whether you're here in the church... Oh, that looks different. Whether you're here in the church or in the shopping centre or you're going to different people's houses, one of the things that hits hard as December starts, you sort of feel it in September, October, November, but once December hits, it's right there, is that there's an exponential growth in the presence of Jesus, in the hearing of his name, in the seeing of him as a little baby in a manger. He's everywhere this time of year. It exponentially explodes, right? And I love it because you start to hear Jesus spoken about. You start to hear him in songs, whether it be in secular or in churches. And you go, that's really cool. But in the lead up to Christmas, not only churches, but the whole community, they hear about this Jesus guy. They hear about this baby born at this time, however many years ago. But what doesn't grow exponentially is an understanding of exactly who this Jesus person is. Exactly why it is that we celebrate him. Why is it important? And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to embark through a series. See, I could get up here, you could get up here, and in 100 words or less, you could describe Jesus. 
I have no doubt about that. But what's better than me describing Jesus or anyone else describing Jesus is letting Jesus describe himself. And so as I said, the Glow Kids and the youth group, they've been going through this for the last little while. And over the next couple of weeks in the lead up to Christmas, we're going to let Jesus describe himself to us by looking through the I am statements in the Gospel of John. See, it's recorded in the Gospel of John. Jesus makes these statements that describe who he is. And before we dive into that this morning, I just want to invite you now to join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that as we enter into this Christmas time, this Christmas period, when we hear about the person of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you that you have told us exactly who Jesus is and why his birth was important. Lord, as we come now to read from your word, and to hear how it is that Jesus describes himself. Would you lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit? And would you reveal to us what it is that you want us to hear this morning? We pray and ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If I was to hand out sheets of paper and say, okay, in six statements, describe yourself. I actually asked the youth to do this. If I was to give this to you, I dare say that you'd begin with physical appearance, move to characteristics of yourself, and then move into things that you like. I did it this week, and what I came up with is in six statements, I would say, I'm tall, I think that fits. I'm active, I'm strong, I'm caring, I'm musical some days, and I'm always up for an adventure. That's how I would describe myself, it fits me. And from onlookers, you might not be able to pick as much as that. You can definitely tell that I'm tall, but if you didn't know me, you wouldn't know I'm musical. So I can describe myself pretty well. And what we get from Jesus is the first way that he describes himself with these I am statements is kind of obscure, right? Because what he says is, I am the bread of life. Now, I'm fairly confident if I had handed out pieces of paper, no one in this church would have written down, I don't think anyone in the community would have written down, I'm like bread. I don't think so. It's a little bit obscure when you read it out of context. You go, Jesus, what are you on about when you say that you're the bread of life? Surely you could have picked something a little bit more relatable. And yet, as we dig a little bit deeper, we see that whilst this statement that Jesus says, I am the bread of life. While it seems a little bit strange, when we dig a little bit deeper and understand the context within which it was said, it has great significance both then and now. And so we have to begin, as, as we look at this statement, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. We go, okay, where do we begin? What is bread? Thanks to Clet, we have some here. It's wonderful. What is bread? Very basically, it's mostly flour, right? Mostly flour, a bit of water, maybe some salt. This definitely has yeast in it because it's nice and puffy. It's pretty simple, pretty basic there. So we understand what bread is. We, We can see it this morning. But what's its purpose? Oh, that smells good. What's its purpose? What is the purpose of bread? I just gave it away. It smells really good. What am I gonna do with this bit of bread? eat it. That's right. The purpose of bread is to be eaten. Why? Because it gives us energy. It sustains us. It sustains our body. It's why I eat so much, because my body's much, much bigger than Zali's. That's at least what I'm saying. Okay? Much, much bigger than Zali's. And so I need to eat more to have the energy to sustain myself. The purpose of bread, the purpose of food, is to nourish our bodies, to give us strength, and to sustain us. In reality, we need food to survive. It's how God has created us, right? I've already told you I eat a lot, but if I was to go for a day without food, I've been told I can get hangry, but I'd probably be okay, right? I'd still be able to function. If I was to go for a week without food, 
I'd maybe start to get a bit weak, a bit lethargic, not fantastic. If I was to go for extended periods of time without food, then I would starve and perish. The natural way that God has designed each and every one of us is that we need food to survive. Food is physically important for our body. And this importance gets so much greater when we look at the context within which Jesus says it. Okay, because we live in a wonderful world, we're very blessed, where just down the road, if I'm hungry, I don't even have to go to the grocery store. I can go to somewhere that cooks me food. Okay, we can go to restaurants, but failing that, we can go to grocery stores and they've got all the food we could ever dream of, plus some that we've never even heard of. We've got it easily. But if we were to transport back to Jesus' time, then their food came from what they were able to grow themselves. Right? If they wanted fruit and vegetables, they had to be able to grow that. They had to be reliant on the weather that it wouldn't be destroyed, that it wouldn't be ruined. They had to be reliant that it would come to be able to be harvested and that they'd be able to gather that and eat it. For meat, they'd have to make sure that the flock stayed safe that the bears didn't get it, and that eventually they would be able to eat it. And so in a world where meat and fruit and vegetables aren't certain, your options become much more limited, right? Jesus couldn't be like, I'm hungry, let's go to the fast food place, or let's just go to the groceries and buy a whole heap of stuff and cook it up. Their options were limited, and so bread was significant. We, we said that bread was fairly basic, right? Flour, water, salt. Fairly simple. And so because of that, as we read through the Bible, we see it. As we look historically, we see that bread was a household staple. All houses had bread most of the time because they could have that when everything else was unavailable. And so bread, very really, for the people in Jesus' time, is a symbol of life. It's a symbol that we have something to eat. It's a symbol that we will be nourished and we will keep going. And we go, okay, that kind of gives us a little bit of context for why Jesus used bread. It's obviously important. So he's, he's trying to say something important here. But why, why would he say that? Why does it come out as the first way that he describes himself? I am the bread of life. It still seems a bit strange. If you've got your Bibles there, we're, we're looking, as Julie said, mainly at John 6, verse 22 through to 59. That's what we're referencing this morning. If we look a couple chapters prior, we see that Jesus was preaching to the crowds. He was teaching them. And as it got late in the day, he said to his disciples, hey, we need to feed these people. Why Jesus knew that food was necessary for physical sustainment, right? He goes, we need to feed these people. And miraculously, he uses five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 people, 5,000 men plus women and children. Miraculously, he physically feeds all these people and the crowds they didn't miss out. They ate lots and lots and lots and so much that there was still leftovers. And then they finished for the day. Jesus stopped teaching. And he sent his disciples over the sea. He went off to pray. And the crowd, they were hyped. They were like, we've just eaten. We've just eaten so much. We're full. We're energized. How good was that? And we're told that during the night, Jesus walked on water. He met up with his disciples and he was over the sea as well. The crowd wakes up the next morning and they're like, oh, where's Jesus? Is he going to feed us today? We saw his disciples go, but he didn't. So they search everywhere and failing to find Jesus, they then also cross over the sea. They put a lot of effort into following Jesus. A lot of effort into following Jesus. Jesus. And when they find him, they see him on this other side of the sea. They go, Jesus, when did you come over here? We didn't see you leave. We would have followed you. And Jesus says these words in verse 26 of chapter 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, 
but because you ate your fill of loaves yesterday. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus goes, I was preaching to you yesterday, I was feeding you spiritually, but that's not why you followed me. Jesus goes, you've put so much effort into following me in the hopes that I will feed you bread again today. He says, check your perspective. Jesus knew that physical food was important, that's why he fed them the day before, but he says, don't follow me for that. There's food that will sustain you into eternal life. Seek that. And the crowds, they get excited by this. They're like, there's better food? Where do we get that? What do we have to do to get this better food? Where is it? And it's here that we get Jesus' statement. Verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus makes his statement and what he's doing is he's making a comparison. He says, you're so focused on the physical bread and that's okay because it's necessary for your physical life. He says, you need bread to survive. I know that's how God's created us. But he says, I am the bread of life. If you believe in me, I will sustain you into eternal life. Can we see the comparison there? Jesus is saying, this bread's important and it gives you life, but I am the bread of life and I give you spiritual life. And by consequence of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, by consequence of Jesus saying, hey, you need me for this eternal life, what Jesus is saying very, very simply is you cannot survive without me. just like we can't survive without food, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm making this comparison. You cannot survive without me. You need me to sustain your life for eternity. And it begs the question, right? As, as I was looking at this throughout the week, I went, one of the biggest costs of living is food. I eat a lot, okay? One of the biggest costs of living is food. We go to the groceries and we buy food so that we can eat and sustain ourselves physically. And Jesus says that's important, but don't put all your efforts into that because whilst you're able to sustain yourself physically here, he says, your fathers ate the manna from heaven that was bread from heaven. They ate it physically and they're dead. It sustained them for a while, but they still perished because the physical food only helps the physical body. He says, I am the bread of life. I can give you spiritual food which will sustain you eternally. And so this first statement of Jesus, slightly obscure, fairly simple, but significant, in its meaning and its implications. See, by being the bread of life, Jesus says, you cannot live without me. You need me in your life. You need me to sustain you. And as we build up to this Christmas time, you might be sitting here for the first time. Maybe you've just felt like you've heard about Jesus and you're going, I don't really know who this is. If you're here this morning and you don't know who Jesus is, can I give you one thing? If you remember nothing else from the sermon this morning, remember this one thing. If Jesus is the bread of life, then we cannot survive without him. And if you want to chat about that, come see me or one of the team. We'd love to talk through that with you. But I'm also conscious, I was conscious as I was preparing, that I'm preaching to a room where most of us are Christians. And when I say that Jesus is the bread of life, we will probably go, yeah, I I understand that, I know that. Jesus is the bread of life, I partake with that. 
I acknowledge Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. I know that he died on a cross for my sins and he's paid the price and that it's only through him that I have eternal life. And so to all the believers, to all the disciples of Jesus in the room this morning, we have to ask ourselves, if Jesus is the bread of life, how well are we fed? Do we eat regularly? See, I eat a lot. I, I was thinking about it during the week and I reckon there's probably a two to four hour window in my life between when I finish a meal and then start thinking about what to eat next. <laughs> two to four hours, that's, that's about the span that I can go before I start to think about physical food again. You might be longer, you might be shorter. The reality is we need food to survive, we need food to sustain us. And we eat regularly. Why? Because if we don't, we perish, we starve. Our stomach sends us signals that we need to eat. And I wonder, are we just as sensitive to our spiritual hunger? If Jesus is the bread of life, are we just as sensitive that we go, okay, I've woken up, I've spent some time with Jesus. Oh, it's been, been a little while. I'm getting hungry. I need to talk to Jesus again. I need to spend some time in prayer. I need to read from his word. And as I was thinking about this, as I was thinking whether or not I get my three healthy meals of Jesus a day, I stopped to think, and I'm guilty of this, I went, there's a temptation as Christians to treat Jesus like a buffet. All of a sudden we get this unmistakable urge of hunger for Jesus. Nothing else can fix our problem. We desire nothing else. And so we go to Jesus and we gorge out and we overeat and, and we're just there. We're great. But the thing about buffets is we don't go them, to them very often. And so we, we get all this input. We, we eat and eat and eat and then we go away and we begin to starve. And then it's a long time before we feel the indication, oh, I haven't spent time with Jesus. I need to go eat again. And we repeat that cycle. And so for us here this morning, we need to ask ourselves, do we eat regularly? If Jesus is the bread of life, how often do we spend time with him? How often do we read the Bible? How often do we pray Are we hungry? Verse 47, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus continues on to, to tell the crowds, he says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you cannot have eternal life because I am the bread of life. And the Jews at that time, the crowd, they, they were confused, they were concerned, right? Because they heard this and they went, Jesus, we don't really want to eat your flesh. We don't really want to drink your blood. That's a little bit weird. But they were missing the point. Church, we're very blessed to be this side of the cross because we can see it play out. We can see that when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, you need to eat my flesh, you need to drink my blood, he was talking about that his body would be broken for us, that his blood would be spilt to pay the debt of our sin. Jesus is the bread of life because he died the death that we deserved and that he didn't. And he is the bread of life. All those who come to him and believe in him are saved because he's paid that price, because he offers us salvation. It's our choice whether or not we partake in that.
when Jesus says he is the bread of life, he says that he is our sustenance. And he says that we cannot live without him. Just like bread, just like food in our lives, when we eat, we can do one of, two, one of two things. We can eat and then go off and burn it out. Or if we're like a buffet, we can just keep eating and eating and eating. But if we don't use it, then that becomes a problem. If we don't burn off energy, it just stores up. And in the same way, if we don't eat, then we lose all energy. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. We need to eat regularly but we need to use that energy to go out and do the things that he calls us to do. And this side of the cross, it's amazing because we see how Jesus intertwines all of this. See, this isn't the one and only time that Jesus refers to himself as bread. In a moment, we're going to partake in communion. And I'm going to invite you, if you're a believer in Christ here this morning, then I'm going to invite you up the front in a moment and we're going to break the bread. We're going to take the bread. We're going to take the cup. Eat the bread in your own time. Drink the cup with us. We'll drink that together. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, if you've still got questions, can I encourage you, use this time. Use this time to ponder. If Jesus is the bread of life, if I need food to sustain me, if Jesus is the only food that can sustain me for eternal life, then what does that mean for me here and now? Jesus refers to him as the bread of life, knowing that we have to eat regularly, and he ties the two together. On the night that he was betrayed, we're told in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, On the night he was betrayed, he took the practice of eating regularly and he applied it to himself. He took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Just like this, they had bread. When he had given thanks for it, Jesus broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. I am the bread of life. My body, my flesh has been broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus knew that we had to eat He knew that we had to drink for the sustaining of our physical bodies. And he says, every time you do this, remember, I am the bread of life. You need this bread to sustain you physically. You need me to sustain you spiritually. In a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you in your own time. Come up to the front. I might get Chris to come and play some keys for me. Come up to the front, take the bread. We've got the crackers there as well. Take the cup, eat the bread in your own time, reflect on all of this. Thank Jesus that he is the bread of life. And if you're not able to make it to the front, it's okay. We've got some stewards. Just put your hand up for us. We'll bring some of the elements to you. And once everyone's served, once everyone's had an opportunity to eat of the bread, then we'll drink of the cup because Jesus says that when we do this, we not only remember our need for him, but we, rep- we proclaim his death until he comes again. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the bread of life. We thank you that just like physical bread sustains us physically, you sustain us spiritually. You have made it possible to have a relationship with you, to be in relationship with God our Father. Very truly, you are not only our creator, but also our sustainer. And Lord God, we thank you for that. 
We thank you that even though we didn't deserve it, you died on a cross for us. Your flesh was broken, your blood spilled out for us. We thank you that you invite us to believe in you, to receive salvation, and to be sustained by you each and every day as often as we eat physical food, to be fed by you spiritually. As we enter this time of communion, help us to remember. Lord God, help us to eat regularly. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please come up. please do just put your hand up and we'll get some of the elements taken to you.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Would you proclaim Jesus' death until he comes again with me, church? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he paid the price for our sin. And we thank you for this practice of communion. Lord, knowing our physical need to eat and drink, you've reminded us also of our spiritual need. Jesus. We thank you that Jesus is the bread of life and we ask that you would remind us continuously to eat well. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the bread of life. We thank you in the name of Jesus.